So good evening, everyone. On behalf of Ehsas Women of Raipur and the entire Prabha Ketan Foundation family, I, Anshay Darcha, welcome you all to the seventh edition of the Right Circle from our beloved city, Raipur. The Right Circle is presented by Sri Seemed in association with Hyatt Raipur and brought to you by Prabha Ketan Foundation and Ehsas Women of Raipur. It is an initiative of the foundation with the noble intention of promoting literature and bridging the gap between an author and his or her readers. Prabha Ketan Foundation has worked relentlessly over the years to promote literature, arts and culture and to bring it to the forefront of our society. We are fortunate to have with us today Mr. Jerry Pinto. Mr. Pinto dons many hats. He is a poet, writer, editor and translator. He's written M in the Big Home, which has been translated into several languages. He's won the Wyndham Campbell Award, the Sahitya Academy Award, the Crossword Award for Fiction, and the Hindu Lit for Life Award. His last novel, Murder in Mahim, won the Rek Wow Award at the Dehradun Literary Festival. And his translation of Baburao Bagul's When I Hid My Cast and Other Stories won an award for fiction at the Bangalore Literary Festival. In conversation with Mr. Jerry Pinto today is Ms. Kalpana Chaudhary, Ehsas Woman of Raipur. So without any delay, over to you, Kalpana Ma. Thank you, Anshil. Thank you, Anshil. And uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Jerry. Good afternoon, Kalpana. So uh, let me begin with this. Shall I begin, Jerry? Yes, please. OK. So you have often proclaimed that you are primarily a poet and one can see glimpses of a poet's lyricism in your prose. You express complex situations and emotions in few words with a unique sensitivity. It's a craft which does not come easily to people. Would you mind if at the very outset of this session, I request you to recite the poem, The Quiet Rebellion of Paper, from your first collection of poems, Asylum. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for those very kind words as well. Uh, 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 and what a lovely sari you're wearing. Thank you. Yeah. Here is the quiet rebellion of paper. See here on this maculate page, a poem struggled for breath, spat black blood and died. And here on this one, a letter left its nail marks as it lost its hold and fell into the abyss. See this hard-edged invitation, serrated in two for memoranda, with plans still born one optimistic morning. Paper is the measure and metaphor of our lives. Our order's young tape rests in white corpse flakes that burn well tear easily, crumple eagerly, aid gracelessly, and cannot resist the blandishments of water. Paper is order and method we think, but on a hot, neat, tight night, paper will rebel quietly. Discarded drafts will invade files. Shredded printouts will peel along the seams. Shattering in nebulae will mate with pocketbooks. Illuminated manuscripts will break from the vaults and head to the fire and kamikaze squad. And we, what of us then? Oh, but it is a sultry night and we are sleeping. Our mouths open, stitched to the pillows with fine threads of saliva. Runnels of sweat course through our hair and our each breath is fitted with gloss. We will rise, coughing in the dawn, to a new world. Rivers black with ink. Bank notes printed with runes. Textbooks in lost languages. And poetry replaced by Reader's Digest mailers. And we will deserve it too. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Aside from other poems, now out of print. <laughs> But Thank you. It, uh, to be uh, reprinted very shortly. So if you like the poem. That's a good news. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. 
I'm sure the audience would agree with me if I say that these lines seem like a metaphor for these unprecedented times where nature is rebelling against humanity. Yeah. And now, and now I shall take the opportunity to read the following lines from your book, Jerry. Tickle me, don't tickle. Me. Yeah. Jerry Pinto lives in the city. This is a pity. Jerry Pinto writes and won't fly kites. Kites hurt birds and birds have rights. Jerry Pinto is old and his knees won't fold when the weather is cold. But Jerry's tongue it's, is still young. Ching chung. What is ching chung? That is a bell. It says nothing else is going to rhyme. Not this time. Jerry, all of us would like to know the creative journey of this mime boy from the asylum to postcards from Bombay in 2019 and the books which are yet to come. Please regale us with your journey of all these years. I think, uh, you know, I grew up at a time, I was born in, uh, in a time when uh, young men who were intelligent in school, you know, and did well in school, were not asked, what do you want to become? Instead, they were asked, do you want to become an engineer or a doctor? That was the way it was in those days. And I, most children are very literal. So I thought, okay, those are the two choices, then I'll become a doctor. So I started actually to study as if I was studying engineering. And it took a friend called Rashmi Hegde at that time. Now she's Rashmi Palkiwala. Uh, to say to me, you know, you should be a writer. Uh, and I didn't think, I thought she was joking. She was saying these things. She kept saying it. And one day she said to me, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say it again if you don't do something about it. So I said, okay, listen, I have a problem. At this time, I was already a mathematics tutor. I was tutoring children across the city. And I was making a, a decent living. I was well known as a tutor. So I said, you know, I have an ego problem. I don't know if I'll be able to take rejection. If, you know, People say your writing is not good enough. So she said, okay, you know what? You write and I'll be your agent. I'll take them to the publishers. I'll take them to editors. And if they reject you, I won't tell you. But if they accept you, then, you know, we'll both be happy. So, and I'll take 10%, she said, or whatever you are. I said, take 20%. I'm fine with that. And actually, Rashmi Palkiwala, Nehe Gre, started me off on my career as a writer. The entire journey started with a friend believing in me and believing in the possibility of my writing. So I'd say to all of you out there, if you're teachers, if you're parents, if, you're, or if you know someone who writes quietly or you know, reads a lot, say to them, I think you could be a writer. Why don't you write something? Show it to them. Okay, and encourage them. Because encouragement, I think, will help everybody. So the entire journey started with one woman's statement. And I think that is uh, what I'm always indebted to her about. And then after that, you know, it was journalism for a while. And after journalism, uh, the inevitable happened. Someone wrote to me and said, would you like to do a book? And I, of course, agreed because uh, Arvind Krishna Mehrotra, the poet, said it beautifully. He said once, he said, if you have read enough books, there is always in you the dream that you want to see your name on the spine of a book. And I thought, yeah, that's right. You know, you want to join that club of, of published people. So the rest of it came down to dreaming uh, uh, and turning that dream into the actual reality of writing, which I always warn people is really like work, okay? In the sense that uh, you've got to think of yourself as a mason. You have to put down a word, then you have to put down the next word, then you have to put down the third word, then you put down the tenth word, then the hundredth word, then the thousandth word, then the ten thousandth word, then the hundred thousandth word, and of those words, maybe 5,000 will be good. Maybe you'll have to edit 95,000. Maybe you'll have to throw out the whole of it. You can never guarantee that the words you're putting down, even in great excitement, even when you know you think the words are running through you, you think, my God, I'm on a, I'm on a roll here. There's inspiration. There's excitement. There's, I know what I want to say, and the words are coming. Ten days later, when you're reading it, you're thinking, oh, my God, what did I do? What was I thinking? How could I possibly have written this? So, unlike the mason, the mason, when he's finished building a wall, if the wall is straight, he hangs his plumb line, he's done. His job is done. He can go home and have a cup of tea and think, I've done a good job. 
the writer never has that satisfaction. We never know whether we've done a good job or not. And we never know if we've done the best possible job that we could do. So that's the struggle always. You know, the journey that we talk about is the struggle. The constant struggle to get somewhere. You have to write something nice. To write something good. To write something, actually, if the secret is, to write something in more. You want your words to outlive you. That's what you want. The big game. Yes. So you have been wearing so many hats of a teacher, a columnist, poet, biographer, translator, editor, and novelist. Each of these have their own challenges. Has it been easy to work in different genres because the demands and thought processes are quite different? Um, can, you, can you throw some light on these on this diverse literary journey of yours? Sure. Uh, you know, it is, uh, it's an odd thing. Um, sorry. In the beginning, uh, when I started writing, I was writing uh, journalism for the newspapers, and I was writing 500 word pieces, and small little pieces. Yes. You see that little is in our time, right? Uh, you saw them in the newspaper, and if you had a middle in the paper, you were very pleased by that. Side. And there were humor columns. So I think uh, taking a step from that that journey, that uh, those middles, to a book was the first big leap that you take. And that first book was called Surviving Women. It's uh, it's a funny book. It's a I think it's a happy book. I like it, and it still sells. And I still have people writing me and saying, you know, Surviving Women made me laugh. I gave Surviving Women to my boyfriend. I like that. Um, but I think each time you take a step, you actually are stepping out into thin air and you are inventing the bridge and walking the bridge at the same time because you don't know whether you can do anything. You only know that what you have done. If I have written a piece and it came out well and an editor liked it and said, Jerry, hey, that's a good piece, you know that's done. But you don't know whether you can do the next piece. And so you don't know if you can do the book. Then you don't know if you can do the translation. Then you don't know if you can do the poem. Then you don't know if you can do the the novel. Then you don't know if you can do the short story. You don't know if you can do the play or the or the or the you know the subtitle. All the things that I have done, each one of them has been an experiment, and there have been experiments that have failed. Okay, those experiments are buried quietly. No one sees them. For instance, okay, to give you an example, when I'm in the big boom came out, my novel came out. Uh, at least two people came up to me, good friends came up to me and said, you know, it should be a play. It's got so much dialogue, it's got so much spirit, it be, let's make it into a play. They were both theater directors. So I said, okay, great idea. So much of this dialogue anyway, it shouldn't be difficult. So I started and I wrote a, a play version and I showed it to the first uh, director who asked. And uh, I thought she'd call up and she'd say, wonderful, let's, let's start, you know, let's start casting right away. Instead of which she rang up and she said, uh, hmm. uh, can you come over and let's talk. Now when someone says that, you know immediately that what you have done hasn't worked. Okay? That's the secret. Let's talk. It's a way of saying, nah, it's not working. We've got to start again. But I thought, okay, you know, you've been in the uh, writing business, whatever, by then maybe 20, 30 years. It's good to go back to the beginning and to learn your craft again. But I think she read the play a couple of, the play version that I've sent a couple of times by the time I reached, you know, one week later I met her. And she decided that it was hopeless and she was going to have to write the play herself. Um, this is slightly surprising, slightly hurtful, slightly odd, but you learn to go with that flow because you've got to say, this is a theater director. This is someone whose work I respect. If they feel this is not a play, then it's not a play. Let's see what happens. Now, it, it's another story that she got busy and, you know, things happened in her in her life and she never got down to actually doing the play or writing the play. But this is what I mean. You do not start or anything with the guarantee that it will be completed or it will be done or it will be accepted, it will be published and it will uh, be good. You start it on faith. You build on faith. Everything is a gamble. Every word you put down is a gamble with the future. And 
therefore, every writer is therefore an optimist because they are gambling on it working. They are gambling on on making the correct call. Okay, that's what we do. We just gamble everything: our time, our lives, our reputations on the possibility that we could do. That's the journey: faith and gambling. Since you have brought the name of your most critically acclaimed and awarded first novel, M and the Big Hoom, and as you say, for a writer, it's always walking the bridge, right? Yeah. So, I, to me, it is a moving, semi-autobiographical fictional story of your parents, which is. the truth while reading the book book what struck me the most was the brutal honesty of m people say i mean for people she must be she herself says i'm mad but i think she is the most honest person in that entire uh, narrative secondly the big hoops acceptance of the situation endurance his stoic and silent support and devotion was the process of writing this particular book a cathartic experience for you did you feel unburdened after completing it because you took 25 years to give it a final shape how how did you feel when you just gave it the final shape and it came in your hands Thank you very much, Prabha. That's a lovely question. You know, that's a very lovely question. Uh, my uh, my feeling at the end of it, okay. Uh, I don't know about catharsis because uh, that's a that's one of those things that I'm told uh, in literary theory that the reader must experience. That art produces an emotional response in the reader and releases their emotions. You do not experience catharsis. Uh, my friend Melly Gobai, as an artist uh, teacher on uh, Knox Market, who used to say, "The bartender is never drunk. The bartender makes people drunk. We, as writers, we encourage catharsis in a in a reader. But it was an unburdening to finally put down the book. And therefore, I think uh, I always say, you know, think about it as some as something like." Going on a long hike with a backpack on your back, the backpack begins to cut into the side of your shoulders. So you ease your fingers under the back and you pull it forward, and there's a release feeling here. Beautiful release. Feeling. The whole of your body feels almost wonderful. And then you slowly have to ease it to another place, and now it's going to cut into that other place. So I'm saying art and writing. Are all healing experiences, but they are not the only healing experiences. In order to heal, we need to make several simultaneous decisions, which is to to express ourselves, to be honest, to take honesty in return, to turn towards the light, to sleep on time, to eat well, to exercise, to open yourself to to love, to give love. All these things come together. So you can't just write and expect to heal. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many poets who kill themselves. There wouldn't be so many great writers who kill themselves. Because writing is one part of healing, but it is not all of healing. Yes. All of healing requires all of you. While reading this novel, there is one line which struck me the most. You have mentioned about losing your faith. Would you share the origin of this statement? How and where it struck you that you had lost your faith? I think um, you know, uh, like most people, see there are people who seem to have a very um, an easy relationship with faith. Okay. Either they completely do not believe, or they completely believe. And if they completely believe, they're very comfortable where they are. And yes. if they do not believe, they're very comfortable where they are. um my position has always been uncomfortable it has always had some discomfort because i i see 
the necessity of faith and i also see the difficulty of faith i see them both and it becomes sometimes a balancing act or even a negotiation faith is a negot for me is a negotiation it's a constant negotiation between the belief that there is something larger than than imminent reality in front of us and the feeling that imminent reality itself is so magnificent why would we need something more why would we need something bigger than that but this comes and goes so um, many of the things that i say in the book are things that are a young person saying it at that time the feeling of that character at that time they are not a personal manifesto okay. Correct. Now let's come to the two biographies. Hal, can am I audible, Jerry? Were you saying something? Okay. The bio, the two biographies that you have written. Let us talk about them. The biography, Helen, the life in times of an of an H bomb, was oh, yeah. hailed. Sorry. was hailed by the readers and critics alike and won you the national award for the best book on cinema on the other hand leela a patchwork life with leela naidu we would like to know what was it like meeting and knowing the helen and i the an iconic figure of indian cinema and the enigmatic persona of leela naidu how was your experience of meeting these two people and knowing them so personally i think uh, in some ways uh, you know uh, with leela naidu it was because she started the process she called up and she said i would like someone to help me write my life and we began to work from that point on and she was constantly and totally available all the time and uh, you know uh, we worked on the book together it was her life told in her words so it's a i book Yes, she speaks, and so my big challenge there was how do I take on the voice of a sixty-five-year-old woman of Indo-French parentage who was once one of the five most beautiful women in the world? Yes. How do I how do I I produce that voice? And for me, the biggest compliment was Sunil Sethi saying, "You can hear Leela Naidu." That was a lovely thing because then I realized I'd done my job for Leela. I had played the venture with Mrs. Gandhi. With Helen, uh, the Helen book, I was not interested so much in Helen the person as I was interested in Helen the persona, because Helen's persona was really larger than life. Uh, she could be Miss Chin Chin Chu. She could be uh, the Countess of Sofia. She could be a tribal girl. She could be Sultana Dapu's Begum. She could be whoever she wanted to be. and if we didn't have helen we would have had to invent her you know so in classic um, patriarchal terms generally you have a heroine who lasts for 5 years and a hero who lasts for 25 years yes. helen was the only woman who lasted 30 years in an industry and 30 for 30 years she danced and at the end of her career she returned triumphantly as a grandmother figure you know So that was a wonderful story, and it was important to tell this story because it it um, it illuminated for me many of the concerns that I have: the marginal figure, uh, the figure of the of um, of the minority, Helen, as a name is yes. not. And may, at that time, when she started acting, many of the of the Muslims or Jews took on Hindu names: Meena Kumari. Dilip Kumar. They took on other names in order to, because they they were told, I think, that um, this name won't work. Yes. We have to have. So now it's wonderful that we have a Jacqueline Fernandez and a and you know, Dino Moreira and just like John Abraham. Everyone yes. listens to them and you know, it's fine. That's what your name is. That's what your Nawazuddin Siddiqui. Does he become any less an actor? I mean, would he be a better actor? We were called. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Uh, Jitesh, you know. So it's nice. It's nice, but that was a different world, and it is important for us to remember what those worlds were like. It is important for us to remember what an item number was. It is important for us to remember how we 
presented the woman's figure in motion. How we presented the vamp, how we presented the heroine. The heroine as, you know, a virginal figure draped in white all the time, and the vamp as someone who was obviously Western and Miss Rosie and was swinging in a band and that sort of thing. I think those are important ways of locating, um, you know, women in, in a popular culture. Yes. It was too stereotypical, and Helen was had always her own place in all this milieu. Yeah. She and and she was really, I mean, till today, if you see watch Helen, something happens to you, you know, yeah, which exactly. generally doesn't happen watching any other item girl. And she yeah. was never an item girl, surprisingly. Yeah. I think what is really, you know, I always say that there was in her in her dancing a, a happiness. You know, yes. if you look at the item girls of today, they give you this chemical. Yeah. You know, like they're going to bite you or something like that. But this, Helen was smiling, she was laughing, she was saying, come and dance with me. Yes. So as soon as you hear one of those great old Helen numbers, you want to get up and dance. And it doesn't yes. matter if you're in Mungara, Mungara, Mengulki, Delhi. You know, you just start like dancing and you express yes. your inner Helen. And it really doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman or a child or a transgender person or a person with a, who doesn't want to, who rejects all uh, identities. There's just such a, such a, such a celebration of human movement. Yes. The potential of human movement to make us happy in Helen's dancing. And I think that's what really, really made us so special. I think I'll play some Helen music after yes. this. <laughs> and maybe I'll I, you know, I read this anthology of yours, A Book of Light. And there are so many heart-cutting and poignant stories edited by you. I don't know, I since you have already talked about the healing process, but somewhere down the line, I just want to ask. I'm I mean, I don't know whether it is correct or not, maybe it's too personal for you, but still I would like to ask that when you were, you know, editing these stories. Were you healed in some way or the others? Was there healing happening? No, you know, what was really, uh, I think, uh, the difficult thing was that this was people, uh, you know, young people from across the country writing into me and telling me the stories of their lives and their pain. The stories of pain, great pain. Now, in some cases, they were good, they were writers. And yes. so they did their job perfectly. They just like sent in the piece and I had to do some a, a light edit and a few suggestions and leave it up. But there were people who were not writers. And then to sit them down and to say, okay, uh, I respect the fact that this happened to you. I respect the fact that you went through hell. But now it is time for us to make this into something that people will want to read. We have to pay att attention now to the craft of writing. It is, that is also important. That was the, really the most difficult thing to do because it meant saying to them, suffering is not enough. Suffering plus craft makes up. Now let's do the craft. And to give them credit, every one of them went through the process of writing, rewriting, editing, changing. And it, it, must, have, it must really have often been very difficult to do, but they did it. And out of that, the Book of Light, I think, is really one of the books of light that I have. So I'm very proud of it. And I'm very proud of all the people who, who participated in it and who contributed to it because they brought to the table the, the invaluable moments of their lives. And it is a book of catharsis. Because many other people have read it and have said that it meant a lot to them. And I'm very proud of it. I, I'm really very touched to see the title, A Book of Light. It has a very apt title, I think. Yeah, I love the title because I thought, you know, the, uh, uh, the space of mental illness at that time uh, was a dark space. Yes. It, it, in, in, it was shrouded in secrecy. It was like what you didn't talk about until perhaps everything was okay. So if someone went through a depression, then after they recovered from the depression, it's all right. So you know, she had a bit of depression. And now she's fine. Now she's fine. Now she's fine. But to say right now, 
my daughter is going through depression she has anxiety issues that's the most difficult thing still in the middle class in india it's still the it is because we're so invested in the picture perfect family and we're so invested in every one of us being in you know uh, at a 100% and firing in all six cylinders but we can't admit to vulnerability and this is it so if someone ever says to you i'm asking all of you here if it someone ever says to you my kid has a bit of depression or whatever be as gentle as you can if you can't say anything don't for every six start with like you know make her drink six glasses of water every morning and she'll be fine and all no gharelu remedies if they have told you something like this they are trying to deal with it maximum you can say if you need something please reach out i do know a good therapist if you need because they may already have it okay so if you can just put on a sympathetic face and say i know it must be so difficult but if you ever need someone to talk to i'm here and when they're talking to you please don't say but you should have said but you should have done but you should have done just listen just be there that's all that's required out of friendship being there and listening that's all that's any and all the people who talk to me about these things these things say the most beautiful things was the friend who just came and sat quiet and listen and i needed to talk and was quiet and i didn't want to talk so we can do that bring healing silence and healing support that's that's being human that's making ourselves more human as well so you feel something in yourself when you learn to say i can't help you but i'm here just to say thank you for saying this to my knowledge your translation of daya pabar's baluta made quite a furore in the literary circles did this translation have a deep impression of your conscience consciousness can you throw some light on the reactions of the people also whatever i have heard of you are quite vocal and concerned about the hegemony of caste color gender and class divide that we as a society are afflicted with do you think that babura bagun's short stories jeva me jaat chori hoti when i hit my cast and the crows are white are the result of this concern pain oh, yeah. sensitivity to these issues i you know i, I it's very difficult to say i am sensitive to these issues or something but i think every thinking person in india must must interrogate her or his own privilege his own privilege more than her own privilege because men are much more privileged than women in general yes. and even among the dalits even among the minorities men are more privileged than women this is true and we have to confront it and we got to understand it now i can go on the rest of my life saying i am a minority in this country you know my or i can say i am an english speaking person with a good education with some money in the bank with a house and now i need to say i am part of the top 5% of this country and i should i should do something i i need to do something and i remember when the babri masjid came down and i said what can i do what can i do i thought, i just wanted to do something I, i i didn't know what to do i seriously felt i think uh, like many of us feel in this today with the uh, with the pandemic on or when uh, there are Uh, there are riots in the in the country. What what can I do? What can I do? And, you know, Bapu Ji comes back to me. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Want walking through Nawab Kali, walking through Calcutta, saying, "What do I do? What do I do?" It's a question that we ask ourselves all the time. Yes. And my answer to myself was, "You can only do what you do. You can't you can't go out and and uh, stop a riot because that's not your job. But you write. How can you use what you do?" to heal what you see for me therefore um translating is sachi dai it is witnessing it is just being a witness to another writer's greatness so you it is actually in translation when we to talk about the power game of translation i actually feel there is an act of humility because you for the time that i'm translating i'm withdrawing gary pinto's voice i'm taking away jerry pinto's privacy from jerry pinto's life and i'm saying this time is now daya pavar's time this time is babura babu's time this time is malika amarshid's time 
this time is uh, Ignat Award's time. Their voices, their stories, we need to hear them. We need to listen to them. We need to cure our privilege by listening to them. Because privilege can be so subtle, so fine. When you have it, you don't even know it. You know, like for instance, in people talking about the pandemic, people talking about that, like, oh my God, you know, I can't get a haircut. Oh my God, the servants aren't coming. Yeah, but you can afford a haircut. Yeah, but you can afford a servant. Okay, the servants aren't coming, the servants aren't earning. They're starving. People are walking hundreds of kilometers home. Your complaint doesn't make sense. Shut up. That's what I think. Sometimes I say this to myself as well, okay, when I'm complaining, because I can complain too. So I'm not trying to be morally superior here. So I say, you know, if you have privilege, and it was a it was a luxury, right? You got born in the right place. You got born to parents who invested in education. You got born to grant that your parents had education. That's why they gave it to you. That's why it was effortless, because when you're taken to a school, you you know, the principal is asking what are the what's the parents' education? So just to get into a school, it's not enough that you, your child should want to be educated. It is important that the parents were educated. Yes. How much can one pay for this? So my because I would like like all of us would like just now we see the earth as wounded, as as you know, abraded by our environmental damage that we have done to it, and we would like to heal it somehow. Some of us can go out and plant trees. Some of us can go out and, and do organic farming. Some of us can write. Some of us can think. Some of us can translate. It is time for us to do what we can do. And to do it as well as we can do it to heal the world. So whatever your job is, if you're a bank clerk, be a great bank clerk and you're healing the world. You heal the world if you're a bank clerk sitting there with a smile on your face and making someone's life easy. He walks into the bank or she walks into the bank and she's got to spend an hour there. She's out in the You have to yes. the, the quantity of human happiness. Be good at what you do and you will heal the world. Strive for goodness. And yes. You to be kind. So you have written so much for children. I particularly like this book of yours, Tickle Me, Don't Tickle Me. Thank you. It's, it's such a collection of poems for children. There are poems of instruction, fun, moms. We generally, they are told, do this and don't do that. You have put those, all those things in such a fun manner, you know. And it's really a delight to read, go through these. I think every school must have it, a copy, and they must follow that with their children. It's so, so where did the thought come? Was it uh, written during a very reflective mood, if I may say? No, no, these poems are, uh, you know, like, I mean, uh, uh, things that happen uh, when you're traveling by bus and there's an irritating child on the bus and you think, what should I, what yes. should I do? And then, okay. like, you know, like a child poem. Or then, you remember, you know, when you, I was in school, you go to school and you'd, there'd be one girl who would always say, or one boy who would always say, I didn't study at all, yeah, I'm going to fail, yeah, I'm going to plug, I don't know what I'll do. And they get like 100 on 100. Actually, you said you're going to fail, yeah, I don't know how I manage that. Yeah. And actually, of course, they would, they, it's just like nasty people. So I thought I'd write a poem about that sort of person. And that's how they came. They came out of a, a cheerful place, like, you know, oh, right. uh, a place of, of celebration, because I think, you know, whenever I write a letter to a child, and I have some young children in the family and friends, children, I start and meet about one paragraph in and giving advice. Okay, so I stop, I tear up the letter and I start again, trying to talk to the child as if the child is also a human being, not yes. a receptacle for our advice. Because a child also can smell it. As soon as they see the advice coming, they stop reading the letter. So they stop reading the poems also, they see a guy coming. So I, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want, to, you know, the first poems that I wrote for children, I mean, when uh, this, the book, the idea for this book came up and Ravi Singh, my publisher said, uh, you know, we should do a book of your children's poems. Uh, the first poems that I started, like I had, to, I had about most of them, but I needed a few more. The poems I started to write was 
you know, I am a coconut tree. I stand with my teeth in salt water, but my coconut water is sweet. And so see whatever your situation is, you can be. I thought like, really, this is so boring. Don't do this. So I then started writing. So then, you know, I wrote the poem about dancing. Like, you know, get up and dance. Just get up and dance. Just get up and dance. Because I think that's what we need to tell children. Experience the body. Have fun. Enjoy yourself. Lots and lots of parents telling their children, go and learn French, go and learn Korean, go and learn ballet, go and learn, uh, I don't know, horse riding, go and learn yes. golf, go, 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 learn, 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 learn. I mean, I remember the benevolent neglect of my parents who let, left me alone just to do what I wanted. As long as I went to school and I didn't fail. <laughs> I remember my father once, uh, a friend of his came over and his friend said, in what standard is he? And my father turned to me and said, what standard are you? And I said, sixth standard? And he said, ah, I'm going sixth standard. Of course. No, not very much idea. Today, yeah. parents know where their child is on the percentile, what homework the child has to do, what project the child is doing, and whether they have answered question seven on that worksheet. I'm thinking that, whoa, that's a lot of parenting. So I think our conversation will be incomplete if I did talk about your second novel, Murder in Mind, which is so diametrically opposite to your first one. It's a murder mystery, I believe, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And I mean, so what was it writing that novel? Thrilling? See, you know, uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, to begin with, uh, when Emily Big Home came out, uh, everyone said, what are you going to do for the, the next novel? And I thought, uh, hello, I don't know. And second, it's not going to be M and the Big Home part two. It is going to be another novel. Yes. And if you, you know, if you don't have the freedom to do what you want to do, then why are we all here? Yeah? I don't, yes. I'm not, uh, I'm I do not want to be prisoner to someone else's expectations, not even my own. So when Section 77 was being debated and, you know, went up to court and the Delhi High Court produced that magnificent judgment and then the Supreme Court in its wisdom struck it down and, you know, everyone was criminalized again. I started hearing stories about how Section 377 criminalized the police force. Yes. Made them into criminals too. And I thought, this is such a bad law, such a bad law. And out of that anger and that the pain of listening to all these stories came Murder in Mind. Now, I could have written an essay saying three, Section 377 is very bad. Yes. And I'm sure Kroll or the, you know, uh, my friend Naresh Fernandez said this Kroll would have, would have carried it. But the people who would have read it would have already thought Section 377. I wanted to smuggle this thing into people's heads who have no idea about Section 377 or are ambivalent or need to be convinced either way. And therefore, the best way to do it was a murder mystery. Because everyone likes a murder mystery. And unless yeah. there can be a subtle message, okay? Mm -hmm. Gay people are human too. Gay people can fall in love. Gay people can be the X. Gay people can be Y. Don't stereotype. Don't expect things out of your children. I need a few messages inside Mother Time. But it was a book that came out of anger, out of anger that I felt about Section 377. And I'm, I was quite happy with the way it turned out. And I've often been asked whether you're going to do another murder, murder mystery. No. Uh, I'll do the next book that I want to write. I'm not doing a book that someone else wants to write. So, can we ask what will be your next book that you're going to write? Okay. If it's no, not too pertinent to ask that? Not at all. Uh, it's actually a book that I, it's uh, Bildung's Roman. It's a growing up novel, a novel about growing up in the 1980s. And, and uh, the central character uh, grows up poetically, politically, and philosophically. It's a big call right now. But it's just gone to the publisher about like a week ago. It's gone to my publisher, Ravi Singh, who's, my first, who's one of my first readers. And uh, Hopefully, uh, he will have something, some, uh, something to say, and I hope it will be positive. Because Ravi's quite can be quite uh, honest and brutally honest. 
So then I'll find out whether it's a novel or not very soon. Okay. okay. So well, Jerry, it has been such a pleasure speaking to you. I throw this uh, platform open to the all the people who want to ask any questions. Please raise your hand so that you know we can unmute you and then you can ask questions. Who's, whosoever wants to ask a question, please unmute yourself and you can ask it. So, uh, you sorry, they will not be able to unmute. I have unmuted poetic devices. This is what I see on the screen. So in right. case if uh, the question could be asked from them. Hi, poetic devices. <laughs> Uh, good evening, sir. This is uh, Neeti. Uh, Poetic Lines is just the name of my ID. Uh, I'm Neeti. I'm from Bhillai, uh, an army veteran, and poetry is my passion. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, Sir, with all the modern day fiction uh, stories being more popular, uh, what is your uh, advice to uh, budding poets like us as to uh, how we should stay motivated and how we pursue our poetry? Okay, uh, you know, um, very early in my life, I was fortunate enough to have a bunch of people around me, called the, which was called the Poetry Circle. Uh, we started it in Bombay. I didn't start it. Other people started it. And I joined a few years later. But I met some of the most exceptional poets of my generation. Gandhi, Postkote, Arundhati, Subramanyam. Uh, you know, and uh, we began, Mustan Sirdarvi, and we began to exchange poems and we began to talk poetry. And those are, up to now, the people who support my poetic endeavor. Nobody else does. As you, you're quite right, nobody wants to publish poetry. Nobody wants to support poetry. If you, you know, if you say I sing, people, everyone will say, "Hey, come on, come on, give us a song. Come on, go on, sing." But if you say I write poetry, they say, "Yeah, yeah, I used to write poetry in college. Now I don't write any poetry, and I don't understand." It. So poets have to support poets, uh, each other. So form a circle in your area. You can't do it. Uh, you can't do it. Uh, you know, live right now. Do it virtually and read each other's poems, read receptively, read intelligently, read with, uh, with, with respect, and take feedback with respect. Second, uh, read poetry. The second way to improve your poetry is to read poetry. Many young poets I know do not buy books of poetry. They just read on the net, and they read each other's poetry. That's wrong. You have to go out and buy poetry. If you go out, you don't have to buy 19th century poets, you have to buy modern day Indian poets in your language. If you are writing in Hindi, go and, you know, Rajkamala's, Vani, they've got brilliant poets and they keep them in, in circulation. They hardly 125 rupees for a Pratinidhi Kavitain. Buy those poets, uh, books of poetry. Support poetry by putting your money where your mouth is. So that when your book of poetry comes out, you can expect karmically that other people will buy your book of poetry. Most poets I know expect want to read poetry on the net, want to read poetry that is out there, they don't put their money down for poetry. And third, uh, be self-critical of your own poems. Just because you have said something does not mean that it is good. You've got to read it, you've got to read it aloud to yourself, see how it sounds, if there is music, whether there is music, whether there is, uh, some, you know, you want that music to be, uh, to be a rhythmic music, you want it to be a, a you know, assonant, you want You've got to make these decisions. You've got to educate yourself. So I'd say reading poetry aloud is a great way to educate yourself. Yeah. Next question. Is there somebody who wants to ask a question? I believe, uh, you know, everybody is so mesmerized with what Jerry had to share. That, you know, everybody is in the assimilating mood. So then okay. can I ask a question? Yeah, that, uh, okay, which there is... is a hand. Sorry, okay. sorry. Right now, it's all right. Please ask a uh, question. Yeah, there is, uh, I'm sorry, There, uh, the name says Alukya Alokya Raje. Please. Ah, Alokika Raje. Alokika Raje. Yes. 
a lot of time go ahead yes alokika we have unmuted you can you hear us alokika we have unmuted you is there anything on chat no i'm afraid there isn't okay Okay. So then, yes, can yes. I ask? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes. Please, please, please. All right. You know, I since I know a little bit of Bombay, not Mumbai, Bombay. Mahib, as I know, holds a unique place in the history of Bombay because Mahib Mahim Creek played a very significant role in the early. times you know during the portuguese times yeah so it's the speciality of the suburb is it's multilingual multi religious there are so many ethnicities people from so many different faiths and there are these three very very popular and prominent places of worship within few i mean within some few furlongs of each other st yeah. michael's church where i think anyone can go and say the novena people go irrespective of their faiths yeah. there is sitla mandir where whosoever used to get chicken pox i don't know about today but earlier on who would whosoever would get chicken pox were taken there to sitla mandir once they were cured yeah. and there is third this dargah of maktoum ali mahimi and these three places are there there are so many different people so many different languages it was a very unique place you know little further away you you had shiv sena's office and this side you had uh, the siddhi vinayak temple and is it was very very uh, nice place to walk also those that road was very good to walk you could see so many different people there were cinemas and all those things how do you feel jerry that place has changed in last 30 to 40 years has it changed or the uniqueness or that you know spirit of that particular place spirit of mahim is still there is it you have to remember that mahim was originally mahitavati it is the place of miracles mahima Okay, and that I think is the uh, the important thing. It's a miracle that it's much of it is intact as it used to be. The Darga, I think, the triple blessing of the Darga, the Sitala uh, Mata, and uh, uh, you know Saint Michael's Church keeps us going because you know, like uh, they try. I think you know there'll be a subway that opens up and then it closes down after six months because no one wants to eat subway, even if you bake your own bread. It's like they try to open these chain stores and nothing happens. Uh, Shiv Sena Bhavan, I have to say, is in Bada. It's not in. Bada. I am farther yeah. away from that road, yeah. on that yeah. very road. When at I the end, I tried to run away from that because I thought it was very small. I remember once I was about seven years old, and someone opened an underwater rainwater storage tank, underground rainwater storage tank. And dark and quiet and water glittering. I just wanted to peek inside, so I peeked in and ran away. And someone went home and told my father before I got home that your son was doing dangerous things, looking into water tanks. What if he fell in and he drowned? So my father was very angry and what? And I remember thinking at age six or seven, you can't walk around this mine without someone noticing you and telling your father what you're doing. So by the time I was fourteen, I wanted to run away far, so I went. I took I got into a college very far away in South Bombay, and in the catapult way, you know that in the boomerang way, you throw yourself far, and then you come back to land. Now I'm back in mine, and uh, with lockdown, I'm stuck in mine, and I'm quite happy here suddenly. Mine has expanded because I've expanded. I was small, I've grown, and now mine has also grown with me. In that sense, I can see its multi layers. I can see Raja Bindle. I can see Shitala Mata. I can see uh, uh, Pokli Mata, who is behind me. The Gopi. Yes. There are three 
cells in our hand which have life turtles in them. You just peek over the well, and a turtle comes gliding up to the surface, followed by a catfish, and it makes you so happy just to look at a turtle diving into the depths of a well. It seems like nature is alive and well. It's giving you a small signal. I'm okay. I'm here. You've done a lot of damage, but I'm not done yet. I have one blessing left for you, a turtle. I, I think we have there is a question, question from Sunaina. Yes. Yes. Uh, we have a question from Sneha. She's uh, put up her hand. I'll just unmute her. Sneha, can you quickly ask a question? Yeah. Hi. So, Sneha here. I read Emerald Moon recently, and I just want to say that it really moved me because. I have been going through a mental illness of my own, and it is the fact that how can we an Indian author write so beautifully about a very very old? So thank you. That's all. So all I have to do. Thank you for the, uh, for sharing that, uh, Sunaina. Uh, I think uh, you know the. Uh, I can only say uh, hang in there. You know. Uh, things do get better eventually. And keep reading. Okay, we so, have a question from uh, somebody called Sanskar. So one last quick question. Yes. Yes, Sanskar. Please go ahead. Sanskar, can you hear us? Okay, uh, in that case, I'll take another question. Just a second. It's in the chat box. It's, it's from uh, Joita. Hello. Yes, ah, Sanskar. Yes, we can hear. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, sir, so I wanted to know. Uh, so, you write on these issues to which to an average Indian, it must be hard to digest. So, uh, it must sometimes feel like you have a responsibility towards the people you portray, uh, the likes you portray. So in that case, uh, does self-censorship come in any way? And should it be a thing for writers? Uh, okay. Um, I think uh, we are all human beings at some level. And we are all, at some level, very courageous. And at some level, we are bad folks also. We are also afraid. We are also frightened. Do I want to be beaten up? No. Do I want to have ink poured all over me? No. Do I want to be uh, taken to court repeatedly? No. I don't want these things to happen. They're not fun things to happen. They're not exciting things to me. But I do want to express my feelings. And I do want, to, but I want to convince you. I don't want to offend you. So my thing is, how do I tell you a story? Uh, in a way that will make you think, okay, I thought X. And I, it's not like I, I want you to think, oh, I was wrong. I want you to leave you with some room for doubt. I want you to leave you with some feeling that, ah, this is also a way of thinking about it. it. may not be my way of thinking about it, but it is a way of thinking about it. And if I can inflect you with that doubt, just put that much doubt in your head, my job is done. Now it's your job to nurture the doubt, to nourish the doubt, to look at your own, at your own, uh, uh, feelings at your own preconceptions, at your own prejudice, at your privilege, and to decide whether you were right or wrong. That's all. We all make those decisions on our own. We all, if, if we are adults and thinking adults and mature adults, we've got to take all the input that we get and we have to synthesize a worldview out of it. You have to begin to think about who you are what your life is, what other people's lives are, and what impact you are having on their lives, and what impact they are having on their lives. This is our job as human beings. That's how we become human. Now, some people will, okay, say for instance, um, you believe in God, and I don't. And I give you 10 very credible reasons not to believe in God. And you say, I still believe in God. What do I say? Oh, that's your, that's what you believe, I respect that, and I hope you will respect my lack of belief. 
can we find a way in which say our dialogue right now in this country has become very polarized it has become x versus not x it has become uh, i am this way and you are that way and because i am this way your that way is wrong and bad no one's i think it is time for us to find the way to say i am this way you are that way let's go and talk about it let's see whether we can find some common ground let's see how we can get on together and then from that from that dialogue will spring a, an enriched life for both of us for because for me for knowing something about you and something about the way you think makes me a better me for you knowing something about the way i i think makes you a better you and this is all we want we want to be better us i don't want to be you you don't want to be me but i want to take some of your goodness take some of what you have and become a better you and if we can use dialogue for that reading for that just to understand each other you don't have to change you don't have to shift your position but you have to make a space where you can understand another person's position that's called being human that's called dialogue actually in the real sense of the word not just in the fake sense of ha 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 ha, ha. yes yes you are you correct but i still think what i do yeah so self censorship i often look at what i am writing and try to imagine a person who would not agree with it and whether they would feel angered by it if i produce anger in you then the result is you are hardening where you are instead of softening to where i am so i don't want to upset you but i want to make you think so my job is how can i find that chink in your armor where i can put the seed in just put the seed so that you can then take it where you want that's my job so when i and that is craft that's really about getting the tone right about not not offending and if you if you as a writer want to insult and offend anybody i would say you have the right it's just not the way i would do that's all i'm saying so i'm saying you want to shout abuse at somebody you go ahead and do it i'm not saying you should i'm saying i wouldn't do it that way because then it hardens and polarizes positions and we don't get real dialogue out of it we don't get any any forward because it is it ends up to two men okay i hope that answers the question sir so jerry thank you so very much for this conversation which was such a delight thank you so much and uh, you made it much more delightful by your presence and by the wonderful and careful questions that you put so thank you so much for that um a very good evening to all so that's a wrap for today i would like to take a moment and extend my sincere thanks to prabha khetan foundation for curating such insightful literary and artistic events i thank shri shimans limited for their pivotal role in promoting our social literary traditions nationwide thank you hayat and her karan sir your mere presence means a great deal to us on my front i extend a hearty thanks to mr jerry pinto who has bestowed us with his company for the right cycle driver there were many takeaways importance of being a good listener having a close knit community nooks and crannies of writing a big thank you to kalpana ma'am for her admirable efforts in moderating the session with her empathetic outlook and a discreet style of explanation excellent well said thank i you must extend so much prabha kaitan foundation for inviting me and for this wonderful platform So today's session has been a real treat until next time until next time thank you all very much